Hello and welcome. I'm Carol Carter, founder and CEO of Global Minded. Thank you for joining us. We're waiting for Dr. Butler. She'll be here in just a minute. And uh, welcome to today's health equity session. Uh, we have a number of different experts today on our topic, which is solutions for inextricably related challenges in health, our democracy, COVID, access, equity, and racial injustice. So we know that these things are completely connected and the people who are our panelists today have some very unique perspectives on how those issues can be solved. So I will introduce um, Dr. Pierre Theodore who also um, works with Dr. Monique Butler on these sessions every month and uh, turn it over to, to uh, Pierre to frame the session and introduce our other guests. Welcome. Great, Carol, thank you so very much. And I just wanna do a sound check and make sure that you are hearing me okay. Is my audio all right? Fantastic. So I wanna welcome everyone and also of course express my thanks to Carol for this ongoing set of discussions around the issues of equity and social justice. And as Carol suggested in her opening remarks, the sort of the intersectionality among a series of social issues across racial and social justice, healthcare equality, socioeconomic justice, and educational justice as well. And we are quite fortunate today to have three really superb guests alongside of Dr. Monique Butler, who has just joined us. We also have Dr. Crystal Rose, who is a physician and is also leads the educational elements at Aussie Media. And will be speaking to us shortly about in my mind, a very important issue of the role of media in telling the stories related to healthcare justice. And in addition to that, we have Dr. Patty Doikos, who is joining us from the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation to discuss the specific program at the BMS Foundation related to health equity. So frankly, I think the frame has been fairly well set by Carol as we've been digging in through a series of conversations around equity. And I think the easiest way is to really kick off the discussion, perhaps Patty, by, Patty, by um, turning to you first, to talk to us a little bit about how Bristol Myers Squibb specifically is approaching health equity. We'd love to get a sense for your approach as an institution, and maybe a little bit of your own background and how you came to be engaged in this issue. And we can kind of kick it off from there before we enter into a broader discussion. Great, thank you so much, Pierre, for having me. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, so I'll start with the second question first and just tell you a little bit about how I came to do this work. So I joined Bristol Myers Squibb about 23 years ago and actually came in on the business side in corporate affairs, looking at how we could support our international markets with the innovative medicines we were bringing forward. And part of my role there was to talk to media and also external partners like patient advocacy groups, support groups, um, to make sure they had the information on our products. That was fortunately, I think for me, in terms of learning how to do health equity work, largely in the infectious disease and HIV AIDS space. And Bristol Myers Squibb as a company is a big player in HIV AIDS. So I kind of grew up learning about health equity from that. And then uh, 18 years ago, joined the foundation and have led international and, and domestic programs in a number of areas from global HIV AIDS to women's health, cancer programs, serious mental illness, diabetes, immunological diseases as well. And um, our foundation's mission is health equity. To address health equity has been that for a very long time. And what we look to do is to improve outcomes and hold ourselves very accountable for that for medically underserved populations around the world. So that in addition to supporting projects, we really work with our partners to ensure that the projects are generating innovative ideas about how to address inequities that are out there and that are truly accountable in terms of at the end of the day for all the funding, all the training, all the activities, is the work actually moving the needle and developing um, answers for more health for underserved populations. And in our foundation, we take a very strong approach of addressing barriers inside the clinic as well as outside the clinic and rely on clinic community partnerships. Since the when you think about underserved populations, it's not, they can be in the clinic with the 
the best clinician in the world and best access to care, but a lot of disease management happens outside of the clinic, even getting to the clinic, having the information to come in for, let's say, initial screening and then retaining um, oneself in care and with the right support really requires those two areas coming together. So we provide a lot of support as well for community-based organizations, as well as health service delivery organizations to partner together and really optimally serve together the full whole patient needs. Thank you so very much. It's such a great introduction. There's a, I took a couple of notes and one of the themes that I think comes up often when we talk about equity work are around partnerships. And, and I, I think we throw around that term, I certainly do throw around that term quite frequently but sometimes I find finding the right complementary capabilities in this space can be very challenging. So as we maybe have more of a panel discussion, I'd love to hear, Patty, a little bit about how you think about partnerships and are you, you know, or is it really kind of pharma to pharma or community-based partnerships? So sort of the, the horizontal and the vertical partnerships as such that you're forming, I'd love to hear a little bit more about. Um, you know, Crystal, it's, uh, I was reading a little bit of your biography before we jumped on today. And it's certainly a remarkable story and your, your travel and your education all around the globe. And I've been a big fan of Aussie media and its sort of approach to almost sort of merging a bit of entertainment and news at the same, at the same time. So I'd love to hear a bit about, frankly, where that overlap between an MD, PhD and, uh, and a media company occurs and, and the approach that Aussie media is taking uh, in the space of health equity. Thank you so much, um, Pierre, and um, thank you so much, Carol and Global Minded for having us here and engaging in this important uh, conversation. Um, I'm happy to share perhaps a little bit more about myself um, and to show you also um, a little bit more about Aussie. So we see how that sort of fits together. You know, um, I, um, you know, was always interested actually in medicine. And so having had the opportunity to study medicine, um, you know, very often when you're studying something really intently, you find that uh, whatever you're specializing in, really, you almost start looking in more inwardly. And in my case, it was, um, I was really interested in oncology because a lot of people in my family were, had this and it, and it seemed to come from nowhere. And it was really kind of like a, a medical mystery, if you will. When I first started getting into oncology, it was the early nineties and um, the death rate from cancer um, for almost any cancer at that time was almost triple what it is right now. And so, you know, just sharing that people going to oncology at that time normally just didn't go into oncology because it was really, uh, really daunting. A lot of people found it very depressing and, um, you know, it, it really, an answers loomed, um, you know, in the future, um, you know, and we're dealing with a lot of things at that time, including HIV AIDS. Um, and as you know, where we are, we, we look really differently. Um, there's, there's a lot of really positive things on the forefront. Um, jump ahead now to today and, um, you know, being at Aussie in a media company, uh, I'll, I'll do another rewind about, um, so I was in um, medical research and, and as a researcher, a medical researcher, um, you know, you do a lot with labs, you, you find and you discover a lot of new things. We were discovering, you know, um, radically new treatments. It was very exciting. Um, but then um, about 10 years ago, I was invited to be a part of an educational coalition where we had the opportunity to work with uh, of colleges and, and universities, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, uh, looking at um, using students' um, skills, but within a global context. And one of the things that I found there are, you know, a lot of the students, what they were studying, what they were learning were things that hadn't yet, um, they were in the books, but the newest things were not in the books. And you kind of wonder, what is the use of these students sitting there working 
and in learning, if they're not really learning the newest, the most cutting edge research. And so um, in, in Walk um, <laughs> Aussie, really one of the things that we do that I really think, um, you know, to talk about the uh, you know media space. You're saying you know entertainment, but we also have in a way um, a public health obligation, right? Because we are a media um, um, outfit, and we do this in different ways. It's uh, whether it's through articles or whether it's through um, podcasts, television shows, events. Right now, um, virtual events. And so uh, that's really how that really sharpens. It's really bringing cutting edge research, taking it out from the ivy walls. I mean, one of the things that we just really don't do very well um, in academia is really share what we learn broadly. And so that's what we get to do at Aussie. Yeah, there's so, so many questions come from what you've just brought up. And it's interesting, you, you and I both share the background of training in medicine in which the idea of a sort of cultural competency, you know, sort of understanding the background of the patients, at least when I went to medical school, was not really incorporated very much into the training. And I and often sort of wonder, and maybe something to reflect on, is to what degree can kind of cultural competency be taught? Like, is there, can it be integrated into medical education in a way that either it's not currently or Maybe there's an evolution that can be accelerated, sort of generate greater cultural competency among practitioners. Um, Dr. Butler, thank you for joining. Uh, please, by all means, feel free to introduce yourself. And I just wanted to give you give you the floor for a few seconds before we went into sort of more of a, you know the usual question and answer panel type uh, session. Sure. Thank you, Pierre. Hello, everyone. It's just a pleasure to be before you. I am uh, currently. In Florida, I uh, have a new role. I am currently the uh, division chief medical officer of uh, 17 hospitals here in the North Florida division. So it's a big leap from uh, Swedish, but I'm excited to, to uh, be here with you today to talk about health equity and to ensure that we keep the action items at the forefront. So I am a first generation college graduate. I'm an internist and I've been in administration for about 10 years now. And I really enjoy that because it allows me to impact many people uh, rather than one-on-one, -on -one, just with the stroke of a pen and making decisions. And you know, Pierre, to the point you just made regarding you know, the medical school curriculum, I uh, did a uh, Martin Luther King Day presentation at the University of Michigan. My uh, alum, uh, I am an uh, alumni of U of M kinesiology. And you know, I gave them a call to action and uh, primarily the Dean of the medical school. I spoke before the College of Health Sciences and I said, you know, when you look at the number of medical school students who um, graduate uh, from medical school each year, and I gave a reference of 2015. In 2015, the graduating class, and this is according to the American Association of Medical Colleges, the AAMC. In 2015, the percentage of, of African-Americans graduating from medical school was 6% and Hispanics was 5%. And when you, you look at the United States population, 13% uh, of the US population uh, is Black or African American. And so I, I gave the University of Michigan School of Medicine Dean a charge regarding matching, and this is for every single dean of medical schools throughout the nation, matching their population with the population of the US, right? So that should be a target every single year. But your question was around cultural, cultural competency. And so one piece is to make sure that we have the representation graduating from medical school and the number of the amount of support that everyone needs, no matter what race or ethnicity. But number two is the, you know, the whole bias, the unconscious bias exam that Harvard does. And I'm not sure if you all know about that. There is a, in, in the Harvard medical school curriculum, they uh, give, it's not mandatory, but it is voluntary where you're able to have a, a sort of a survey around your own unconscious uh, bias. Uh, based upon racial backgrounds and ethnicity. You know, I think those are two starts. One is to make sure that our medical school graduates are resembling the U.S. population and holding uh, our deans of admissions uh, to that from an accountability perspective. And two is perhaps uh, mandating the cultural, the, the uh, conscious bias survey that helps. Uh, and that's not based upon ethnicity at all. 
every single student can take that survey to be able to understand any hidden biases that we all have. We are we are all human, right? And we all have biases and we need they need to come to the forefront. Uh, you know, I think that's that that would be a start. And so I know that I'm not on the panel, I'm actually helping with the panel, but I wanted to make sure that I answered that question, Pierre, because that's near and dear to me. And the, the, uh, I had a number of listeners on at the University of Michigan. I've heard a lot of feedback from that meeting. So a number of call to actions and, and accountability uh, that I think we need to uh, put at the forefront in our medical school education. I think that's a great question. Yeah, the point's really well taken. And, it's, and, I, and I, some, I often reflect on my own um, personal education when I think about health equity and that as a medical student, as a resident, I was often taught around racial and ethnic differences. I can't tell you how frequently someone would say squamous cell esophageal cancer happens in black patients and Pima yeah. Indians have a high rate of diabetes. And it's sort of like, that was sort of where the conversation ended. And mm -hmm. that ability to go a little bit more like on driving these population health. For some reason, we very rarely went to that extra level. We, we might say that Pima Indians have a higher rate of diabetes because of a high rate of obesity, but not really reflecting on the legal framework, the historical legacy of discrimination that led yeah. to the dietary habit. And that the same genomic or population right across the border in Mexico did not have a similar level of type one diet or sorry, type two diabetes. And it sort of puts into context that often in our education, we end with the discussion of this disease process is higher in this population. It, it, it even sure. gets even worse sometimes in the case of trauma. Uh, sometimes you'll have this conversation as though it's inherent to an urban population right. to somehow be at risk for trauma uh, instead of like going back to sort of the fundamental mechanisms that drive that. So my hope is, and you're expressing that Monique, um, that all of us as educators and those that have impact on educational systems can begin to get back to those sort of more fundamental determinants as such. Um, yeah, and to that point, Pierre, the question, next question is why, right? So, and, and I heard that repeatedly in my uh, education as well, but what I didn't hear was, was why is that the case, right? What, what are some of the reasons behind it? Now, it would take historians, it, it, it could take, you know, sociologists. It, it would take many people to be, you know, guest lecturers in the lecture room to talk with medical students around the why behind, uh, why certain uh, disease states are more prevalent in certain racial groups, you know, and then you get into what we described as racial body politics and what that does based upon how someone looks and their, uh, you know, facial features or color of their skin how that plays into the perception of the medical student or the physician. So, you know, it's, it's, it takes a lot of work, but there needs to be a certain level of accountability around, let's get to the why behind it. It's not necessarily genetic differences that are reasons for the, 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 the higher prevalence in many of our underserved communities. But a lot of it is, as we all know on this panel, the social determinants of health, you know, and I'll just say this one uh, statement quickly. I, teach residents and medical students, you know, I, I don't want to hear a lot around patients being non-compliant because the default, right, is for people to want to live and for them to want to be healthy. The next question is, oh, you prescribed the medication. Why didn't they take it? Oh, they, they're non-compliant. No, it's probably because the medication that you wrote, they may not have been able to afford or were they able to get the transportation to get to the pharmacy to be able to get their medication or is the food uh, in industry and in their community more expensive than it is in another location and they are unable to, to, to purchase food and, and can't purchase their pharmaceuticals. So that's a whole culture shift that we need to get to from a medical community and educating uh, the next generation of doctors. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. It's starting to think about where the locus of blame is often placed because there's a yeah. tendency to often place that blame onto the shoulders of the vulnerable population instead of asking ourselves about the systems around that population that have sort of led to that inequity. But Patty, let me turn back to you. I, I want to put you a little on the spot a bit from as you and I both come from pharma background and whether it's my part from Johnson & Johnson or Bristol Myers, but these are gigantic organizations. 
there's always this interesting kind of a firewall between the philanthropic group and the sort of commercial organization. It has to be there for legal reasons and you know, obviously different structure between a foundation and the main business of BMS or you know, our global community impact group at J&J. But I, I'm curious, uh, because you've come from a commercial background, are there places where the what the foundation is doing and what the charitable arm is doing can overlap with the commercial business as well? And I'm just I'm just curious if there's a way to balance uh, efforts on either side of that sort of firewall between the commercial and the philanthropic parts of your business. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. It's interesting that you ask me this question because this year I have a split role, so I'm spending uh, for, for the last year or so half my time doing my foundation work. And then the other half has really been about mobilizing our organization, the company side to adopt a health equity approach. So as a patient-centered company, how do we become an inclusive patient-centered company? You know, how do we think about um, not only who are medicines reaching now, but who aren't we reaching? And why is that? And what are the changes that we can make based on where the company sits at the table to change how it approaches? Um, reaching out to patients and engaging patients and, and informing also the healthcare providers that take care of them, um, as well as um, you know, working on the foundation side. So, and interestingly, the charge always came from our board as we did our foundation work in HIV AIDS. There are lessons that the foundation partners are learning. There's knowledge they're generating about how to improve access to care, the quality of care, health outcomes, tapping into not only changes in health systems, but also these community supportive services, bring those lessons back to the company, you know, let's into the broader field of the healthcare ecosystem. So, um, you know, one of, I think the big um, accomplishments of this past year has been for a lot of time people were talking about how terrible health disparities were and not doing much about it. Now we're in the, you know, the solutions have been developed over time and they're coming forward. So, you know, to this, this question, the, the foundation, we like to support and give opportunity for innovators in um, health equity to have a chance to try new things, do demonstration projects and uh, add to the knowledge base. On the company side, we're now looking at what are the levers, the ordinary levers that we can pull. So a couple that we're pulling now that you, you mentioned a little bit earlier is that the company made a $300 million commitment to advancing health equity and also diversity and inclusion. So you know, $150 million are going to two things on the foundation side, continuing to support these innovators for more um, ideas and models of care, outreach and engagement, system change to drive more health equity on the foundation side, but also another 50 million to the ordinary partners that the company has in patient advocacy and medical associations as they step up their work in the health equity space as well. So those are corporate giving grants that are going on that side. Other kinds of complementarity work, complementary work, the foundation launched a $100 million initiative for um, training uh, diverse investigators and investigators serving diverse communities as a way to ultimately drive greater diversity in um, clinical trials, speaking very much to what Dr. Butler just spoke about. You know, that's another kind of challenge that we will have is, is increasing the, the workforce and the diversity of that for um, investigators, clinical trial investigators. At the same time, on the company side, they're taking a hard look at, at company-sponsored trials. What are the sites? How diverse are the communities where the sites are happening? We talk a lot about uh, clinical trial deserts, um, right. you know, to see where aren't we? <laughs> And how can we build capacity in, in communities that do not have good access to clinical trials, which is really, I think, for us, not only um, advancing research, but a quality issue, right? Because you, patients may come to a clinical trial is the only option left for them. And so at least having the opportunity to, make, to have that information about that option and participate is really important. So, you know, we are really working on, on both sides and foundation really um, is focused on these very large innovators. And then the company is, is taking a hard look at itself and saying, you know, how can we do all of these things better in terms of our sites, investigators, the way we reach out to patients 
but also, you know, um, advisory boards within companies are very important. Who's at those tables? What's the diversity at those tables? Beyond the diversity, who, what is the diversity that they have in terms of um, those advisors actually serving in heavily diverse and medically underserved communities so that we have safety net hospital uh, representatives on advisory boards, as well as the big highly resourced centers of excellence, you know, NCI comprehensive cancer centers, as an example. Um, and also now our leaders for their functional teams as they declare 2021 objectives are naming health equity yeah. in those objectives yeah. and, uh, and saying it is everyone's job in this organization. We have to push the perimeter on who we reach and we have to change who we're engaged with to do that. We have to disaggregate data so we have a deeper understanding of who are the populations that we have an opportunity support and that we are reaching through our uh, products and programs. And where we are not, we have to double down and figure out how to get there. It's going to involve getting with new people um, and um, creating new opportunities for, for partnership as well. So this has been a real breakthrough year for Bristol Myers Squibb um, in sort of the company catching up with the foundation, that this is not optional, that in order to drive a, a mission of um, a patient-centered mission, if you're not doing health equity, you're not doing it with excellence. You know, it's going to create better science and it's going to create better reach and impact so that at the end of the day, um, you know, we have the best opportunity to use the innovative medicines that the company creates to actually create, generate as much health as possible and pull off as much suffering as possible for the affected populations. Yeah, you know, you mentioned something I think is absolutely critical, Patty, which is, as you were talking about the 2021 sort of commercial goals for the commercial leaders to start to think about true performance indicators related to equity. And, and I think most companies at some level have gained a sense of comfort with diversity internally. We, we ask ourselves, what are we doing right. to create a diverse, you know, slate of applicants and ask ourselves, are we making sure that voices are present at our table sort of internally? So that sort of diversity indicator has been present. But this, I think this idea of, well, what about what we're doing in the world? You know, what it, are we actually impacting equity with the products and services that we are bringing to market? To me, that, that sort of thought process, integrating that into performance indicators is, is really the key because it becomes a standard by which we, we measure ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's funny how the culture can change. And then you know, 20 years later, you think, oh, of course, this is just natural. We must always think about it, but it, it takes this concerted special effort here and now where we really begin to focus and concentrate on equity issues. So uh, the language that you use in, in, in you know, supporting the business leaders and helping to think about equity, I think is really key. And also to measure themselves to measure. some degree by how well we address these equity issues. Yeah, measurement and risk. Right. So just like the other, you know, metrics on the scorecard, at least for me, for my company, HCA, with over 180 hospitals uh, mm -hmm. throughout the nation mm -hmm. on the scorecard. Right. It's EBITDA. It's growth. It's strategy. It's quality. How about diversity and inclusion and equity being on the scorecard for performance evaluation? Right. So it needs to be tied to to, you know, to dollars. Yeah, and I actually came, for, I'm sorry for joining everybody late, Carol. No, we're that. so excited you're here, Donna, because Donna is the person on the ground in the hospital and has been, you know, with every single care worker there in New York City, the worst place that has been hit by the pandemic. So we are so grateful, Donna, that you're here and to share no your problem. perspective. No Welcome. Problem. I was going to thank you. I was going to comment about Dr. Butler's statement, and this actually applies to the organization I spent the longest of my career with, which was Kaiser Permanente. And in fact, yes. the individual executive um, incentive comp, which was, you know, sort of, it's not like you just get it, it, it was so in, in, embedded into how you got paid that. You know, everybody really focused on it, but diversity and inclusion, there were several aspects of diversity and inclusion that were included um, back as far as 2005 when I joined the organization. 
that um, were part of a core responsibility, whether it was around mentoring, whether it was um, and our former, 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 former CEO, George Halverson had it as a um, requirement that we could not for any job vice president or above um, not have a diverse pool. And the diversity could be multiple kinds of diversity. It could be even if you had, let's just say for argument, three black women were your best finalists, you had to find somebody that had a different diversity profile in that so that you got a mix a point of view. So anyway, um, I would echo that. I'll, I'll just add to what Carol said, which um, although New York is happy to, uh, you know, I don't, I don't quite know what wave word to describe what any of us are in around COVID, but um, in spite of calling our being Columbia University, we actually are physically located in Washington Heights in um, in Manhattan, which is a very, very diverse uh, neighborhood. Our patients come from the South Bronx. They come from um, the neighborhoods here that include Harlem uh, and uh, Washington Heights, which is heavily um, Hispanic. And, um, you know, we have seen our patients, you know, uh, obviously disproportionately impacted by COVID. Um, and that, you know, I, I do believe the with every crisis, there's an opportunity. I think there's been multiple events over the last year, including January 6th, that have um, forced us to um, open our eyes even wider and um, identify who we are and what we need to do. And so the imperative of a lot of the um, racial issues over the last year that include COVID disproportionately hitting communities of color, the resistance that we now have around the vaccine um, have really created, I think, a new way of us all owning up to what we have to do with, you know, faster, deeper. And I think as I heard the tail end of the conversation, it's now so embedded in the mindset of the leadership. It's now about measure, you know, setting up some measurable benchmarks over the next several years so that we don't just talk about it. It's easy, you know, let's have a, let's go to a webinar. Let's, right. we need to really own up and be transparent about what it is that we're doing. Um, you know, not just some symbolic things, whether it's having a little diversity and inclusion thing on your website or celebrating Juneteenth or, you know, it's got to be much more tangible in terms of measuring health outcomes for the populations that we serve and um, making it concrete to pretty much everybody. I mean, everybody in the organization. Yeah, how do we do that? So Dr. Lynn, thanks for joining us and thanks for that segue. Uh, if you can introduce yourself and give us some background information. I know that you were in Colorado when I was there. Uh, I'm currently in Florida and you're in, in New York. If you can give us some background and then I'd like for each of the, the panelists to take a, a dive deeper into what Dr. Lynn just said, you know, now is the time for us to, you know, look in the mirror as a, as a nation and see where we are, but what do we do next? And what are some actionable items that we need to take? Well, I'm going to guess I'm the oldest person on the call, which means that my background is so long and I'm also complicated that I could take forever, but I'll say this. I've always been motivated by um, helping people who needed help. And so, I mean, that came from being very impressionable as a, as a watching President Kennedy and watching the 60s. And um, so I've had a career, a long, long career in public service at the city level for 20 years, at the state level, and even a tiny little bit at the federal level. But it's always been about healthcare and or um, public service. So, and there's a, you know, pretty substantial intersection between the two. I mean, most states, you know, at least a third of their budget is on Medicaid and there's a multiplicity of other health functions that states have. So um, I never had the, the gumption to be a surgeon, uh, but I did have the passion around finding other ways that I could be involved um, in healthcare. And so right now I'm at Columbia, as I said, at the medical center, um, we have um, a very strong relationship with a 10 hospital system called New York Presbyterian Hospital. We have 2,600 beds in 10 hospitals and uh, 2,000 physicians and about uh, 
114 outpatient locations. So we're really a outpatient provider that's partnered with a hospital. And, and as you heard, um, you know, COVID at its peak, we had in just this 10 hospital system, we had uh, 2,500 COVID positive patients. We redeployed uh, 1,200 uh, doctors and staff members into jobs they hadn't done in perhaps 30 years. And so, you know, I had an ophthalmologist in the ED, you know, all the things that you heard about. Um, and um, now we're continuing with vaccines. I was a patient uh, navigator on Friday night as a volunteer. Um, I will tell you it was the most fun I've had in my entire life. <laughs> so I don't have to sit at a Zoom. Um, but, you know, as I said, the, that vaccine hesitancy issue is one that's really, in my mind, is something we ought to talk about as we go through this panel, um, because we've done some of the, we actually did a survey of the demographics of our population, and they're either, did they get the vaccine or not, and what's their intention, and the disparities that you're hearing about are all very clear, and as we know, the both the the health disparities, but also the economic dislocation in our communities of color in particular are stronger. And so, you know, I always say I, I work in your community. That's what I say to the elected officials and the people around here. And therefore, I have an obligation and we all have an obligation to help support the community even outside of our little microcosm of a hospital system. So anyway, that's that's who I am. I have a DRPH, and other than that, I'll stop. Excellent. Thank you. I wonder if uh, Dr. Um, Crystal Rose can give us, you know, just your your feedback on what we just posed, which was, you know, we're looking at ourselves in the mirror as a nation. Where do we go from here from a health equity perspective, and how does your company uh, help us with that? Thank you so much, Dr. Butler. Um, you know, really thoughtful conversations. And, you know, I, I'm looking at some of the comments here. People are saying, you know, it's an inclusional divide, like the digital divide, that um, we need to start from structural racism. Um, and then you really pointed out the conscious bias project that Harvard is doing. Um, this, you know, so called um, implicit bias, you know things that people have some sort of uh, prejudice against that they may not, may or may, it's, it's basically that they, they don't realize. And, you know, for the longest time, businesses realize, you know, if they weren't sustainable, then they couldn't last. They, they wouldn't be able to grow. They wouldn't be able to develop. And now we, we were looking at sustainability more from, more of an uh, economic, perhaps, you know, climate, um, energy. And we've added to this now race because one of the things that we recognize that we can no longer leave out is leaving people behind as we've done. Um, it's, it's not sustainable. So that's added to it. Um, you know, at Ozzy, and I'm the executive director of academic affairs at, at Ozzy. And um, one thing that we've done, you know, over the years, we've always been very clear about diversity and inclusion. And it's something that really doesn't happen overnight and it's difficult to happen overnight. But, you know, we do encourage people to do that. And how do we do that? By the type of, uh, of things that we showcase. Uh, there's been a lot of polls out there, people looking at, well, what do people want to hear? People are tired of hearing negative news. Well, Ozzy is one of those types of publications that we don't necessarily, we're not an echo chamber. So you're going to hear a lot of different voices, politically speaking and otherwise. We think that's important. We think that, um, but we also know it, we have an obligation to really show people across the world but also highlight the problems. Um, we have you know, 75 million readers, viewers, learners, and listeners across all the different um, aspects of what we provide and however people need to see and hear um, and, and communicate. 
And so one of the things that we find very important is that we just don't, you know, give out information, but we also interact through very much a part of, you know, engaging with our audience. Um, you know, there's a saying for lack of knowledge, people perish. And so one of the things that we see that we do and provide and, you know, eliminating this knowledge gap is providing that information is, you know, having citizen scientists sort of sharing, you know, of these really important disseminating the data um, as, as um, Donna, you were talking about, um, Dr. Lynn, that you were speaking about, you know, and how do we push that perimeter? We, we do that, you know, in, in ways that we create opportunities for people to, um, to learn, to explore, and to even analyze and go deeper. So we have a very close relationship with a lot of, uh, you know, top people who are doing the research. Um, and we also showcase whether it's television shows, uh, we just had Dr. Anthony Fauci um, on, or people who are, you know, again, citizen scientists who are part of, you know, contributing to medicine in some way, um, like Bill Gates. Um, he was also on our show on, and it's on YouTube. And uh, we currently have, you know, our platform is free. Um, we have a lot of free resources and, you know, people talk about, you know, the news to knowledge continuum. And so Aussie's a part of that. When I was talking about sort of public health and sharing the, you know, information that is out there, we created pretty much early on um, town halls with black women and talking about the disparities. You know, a lot of people were confused when they recognized that people were, you know, protesting in the streets. And yet at the same time, we had this pandemic and they couldn't reconcile the two. And so when we talk about sustainability, um, you know, public health specialists had determined that racism was far more dangerous than the COVID. And so I think I, I, I'm happy to go further, but I'll take a stop there because I think that's important to, to um, yeah. Okay. Your, your, your last comment, I think really, really resonates with me, Crystal, yeah. and it's that, you know, racism is, is rarely the issue that we're facing here is sort of interpersonal frank racism. It is a, the structural elements of racism that themselves lead to tremendous healthcare burdens in the United States. And the, you know, one of my colleagues is a Dean of Public Health at Tulane, his name is uh, Thomas Levis, has done a lot of sort of health economic research mm -hmm. on the, the impact of this legacy of racism. And it is a drag on all of society. I mean, I mean to the tunes of tens of billions of dollars a year, that's yeah. really strictly tracks back to a historical legacy of racism. So in some ways, there's a question here about cultural trans transformation, addressing issues around structural racism. Yes, of course, it is the right thing to do, but it's also to recognize that we are all regardless of our economic status, that we are weighed down by these legacy issues. Make a, a super quick point there. Real, I just want to say real quick that I, I think what people need to understand is this is not right for like all children, like just for your family. It's not going to be right for your children. Like it's all interconnected, yeah. all of us. Great point. Yeah. Right. And Pierre, if I can just follow on what you said, um, and COVID taught us this, right? When, when, when we finally had uh, race specific data, that's when it was started, finally folks began to understand that, um, that this is structural. Um, and that really goes to, I think, part of the continuum of activities that need to happen, going back to even what you said about, you know, before sort of medical community, pharma, others would say, you know, if the patient would just comply with the medication <laughs> that we've provided or the standard of care and the, the regimen, they could achieve the outcomes without understanding sort of the bigger context. But now I think that has brought forward that there are these structures that are in place. Everyone needs to look at, take a hard look at themselves to say, how we perpetuated those structures 
and exacerbated these inequities? How can we un disentangle that and go in another direction? And you know, to your other question earlier about partnerships, it's going to take, if we're gonna take an ecosystem approach, really partnerships across sectors to get there. Um, Public-private partnerships, space for you know, almost being able to throw out the old rules. And let's just see how to do this right. Can we get some kind of a zone where truly new ideas that are not stuck in the old way of old ways of doing things that perpetuate these inequity can actually have a chance to um, create some sunlight on, you know, the really drastic changes, the new mental models that people need to adapt in order to go forward. But a lot of it just starts with people seeing the data to see the difference. And we talk to, we've talked to a lot of different healthcare providers and health systems um, over the last year, just to hear where they are on health equity. And when we ask them, you know, do you feel that your clinics deliver, um, you know, the same standard of care to everyone? You know, of course it does, without ever having said, okay, let's, let's disaggregate the data on things like delays in, um, you know, diagnosis from having been screened. Uh, for cancer or whether care was actually completed. So this really important work of um, disaggregating data and looking into what is actually, are there differences among populations and the experience that they have with accessing care, the quality of care they have and also the health outcomes. And I think the quality improvement community has been an important lever to push on this because they see it as, oh, that's a variation in care. We, have, we know how to go after that to start to look at why is that variation there and then unpack and begin to improve, improve things. But you know that, that just laying bare the data and even the data that we do have on COVID for both incidents and mortality is incomplete data. So we also need to complete data sets so that we can really see the full picture of impact and difference and how we can um, really focus on those who have been most heavily impacted. Yeah, and I think that's part of what I was saying, um, as horrible as COVID is, and we've all lived through it, both in, either as individuals with our own fears and anxieties, our workforce, our friends, our family, et cetera. You know, to me, there's the silver lining, which it has really brought to light the impact of um, inequities of care. And, and so the underlying medical condition conversation, you know, has, has been had, but I'll even give you just a little snapshot. It's interesting. We, somebody mentioned, Carol mentioned the digital divide. So um, we were initially in for a very short period of time, you know, quick to talk about vaccine hesitancy and, and different groups. But one of the biggest barriers to scheduling an appointment to get a vaccine is internet access and, um, and the ability to sit at your computer the way that it works, at least here, is it's kind of like, I call it, let's sign up to get tickets to see Beyonce, right? So you try to get online and then all of a sudden, one minute, you're shut out. How is that possible? Well, because there are other people who are white collar, you know, maybe, you know, great internet access, great skills, it's English speaking, able to sit at their computer and just keep doing this, whereas a lot of our a lot of the people that are not getting the appointments don't have internet access, et cetera. And so, you know, we realized in the first two days of opening up um, access to the public, not our own employees. You know, first step when you're a healthcare institution is getting your own employees, you know, vaccinated who are patient facing. But once you open it up to the public based on these other criteria, and I volunteered and I began to see, gosh, this doesn't look like our community at all, only to have the light bulb go on in addition to whatever hesitancy there might be for very legitimate reasons that we need to spend more time educating people about. There is this digital divide that exists. And so whether it was around scheduling appointments or staying healthy when you're afraid to go into a doctor's office because you don't have access for telehealth, you know, you don't have that, that bandwidth. Um, we've said, how do we have a more proactive outreach campaign where we're going to places, we're going to churches, we're going to community leaders, and we're saying, we're going to do a manual sign up. It's going to take us four times longer than this really cool um, app that we have, but we think it's part of our responsibility against the community. So I think, you know, we have the data we need the resources to be able to do what we're going to do. 
whether it's bridging the digital divide or it's even doing things like waiving co-pays for, you know, it's January. I got my first, uh, I had to fill a prescription. I had, was in a state of shock when I got my copay because I have a very high deductible health plan. And I thought, but I'm okay. I still was in a state of shock and even considered, do I do this? But imagine if your income doesn't support doing that and you're making those other kinds of decisions. So we have to, we have to, spend time on thinking about creative ways to deal with it. And we also have to put some money up front so that finance isn't a barrier to getting the care. Yeah, I think one of the themes to what you just described, Donna, is the, sort of the idea of sort of taking medical care to those who are most in need. In a sense, um, almost mobilizing the care and reaching out into the community often the underserved population, for good reason, have a degree of mistrust or distrust of medical systems. And so they're reticent to actually participate and go to the medical system. So through a trusted path, a trusted channel, it's best to really reach out into the community. And to me, that's why, to your point earlier, Patty, why the partnerships here are so critical. And what, what in my mind, what COVID-19 has sort of taught us is that it, it can't be just you know, pharmaceutical giant alone doing the work. It has to be the sort of liaison with community partners. It has to, you know, increase our ability to reach out to those who are most in need if we are really addressing equity issues, population health issues. So I think what you're, you're pointing out in some ways is almost a concept of not so much sitting back and waiting for underserved marginalized population to access care but what are the mechanisms that we can take to reach out to those underserved and marginalized populations? Yeah, that's a good point, uh, Pierre. You know, the piece that I struggle with is that, you know, Martin Luther King said back in 1966, right? That, you know, the most um, inequality, right? I'm gonna pull up his, I can't, I haven't, I don't have it memorized, but of all the forms of inequality, injustice and in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman mm -hmm. because it often results in physical death. That was in 1966 to the Medical Committee for Human Rights in Chicago. Here we are in 2021, and thankfully, COVID has become the, the curtain has been lifted to disparities, but many of us on this call today, many listening know that the disparities have been present for so long. And, and, and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said it decades ago, but still we are at a point where we're saying we need more data, we need more data in order to be able to improve you know, what's happening. You, we can go to right where Dr. Lynn is or go back to, to my community in Detroit. And you can get all the data that you, you, you need in two hours, right? Definitely we need data, but what, is, what, what else is there that needs to be done so that we can stop hiding behind the data piece and stop hiding behind you know, needing more information when there are people who don't even trust a life-saving vaccine that can end the pandemic that we all have been under for a year with almost a half a million people dead. That level of mistrust is so deep that there, there has to be a wake up call and a call to action to say, yes, we need data. But listen, ladies and gentlemen, if the majority called out and said, like it is, it is what it is, which is the structural racism that has been in this country for centuries, then waiting for data and waiting for more information to me seems like it is, you know, just another excuse to hide behind numbers. That, when you take a moment to think about the, that fact that we just made, I think Dr. Lynn said it and you just said it, Dr. Uh, Theodore, we have people in this country who despite a solution to ending the pandemic, and you know, many of us physicians on the line went to medical school, it's immunology one-on-one -on -one with mRNA, right? It, it, it's pretty safe. They are so hesitant because one, they may not have people who look like them, who they can trust to tell them that it's safe. And two, we're still saying we need more data. How much more data do we need when people in our communities would rather suffer from COVID-19 and die on a ventilator than take a vaccine? That's enough data to put many 
collaborations in place immediately so that those millions of dollars are mobilized to communities in a structured way, in a strategic way to help to end the structural racism and you know the residential segregation right the police brutality right the the redlining that exists in our communities all of, a lot of that is the underlying impact of why we're so sick and so how much I, I just need the panel to help me understand how much more data do we need in order for us to stand up and get our politicians in in, in line and get the the ceos of our companies who are allocating big dollars to make some changes Help me understand that. <laughs> I think Carol, you were prescient because Carol sort of posed that as our last question, right? I mean, I think we have a tremendous opportunity. And, you know, just like when Barack Obama became the president, one of the first things he did was give money for electronic medical records, which I know most people were scratching their heads about. Um, he's got a lot on his plate, but I would argue that this this isn't, I think, to Carol's question, this isn't just about, this isn't about COVID. I mean, we all want the vaccine, everybody wants that, but this is about the fundamentals of health, and um, I hope he's got the right people around him to push this, because I do think it's the big human tragedy that we still have, you know, tens of millions of people uninsured, we have tens of millions of people that even though they're uninsured or really underinsured and he's got to that's to me the first thing it's exactly what you said Monique it's the fundamental you know education and health care two fundamental rights we got to fix health care and I I'd, I'd agree with that Dr. Lynn but I'd also jump in and we'd say we also have to fix education and they really do go hand in hand with everything um, it's not only just educating the education system but we and the medical system, but we have to educate the educators and educate and re-educate and retrain our medical team um, and, and our, our, medical, our medical system because that's part of the problem that we're seeing. And you know when you look at places like in Africa who are also experiencing that, but mostly South Africa, you know, is having some of the similar, you know, casualties. And you know that the, the social fabric there is something that is akin, you know, is, is happening in the US as well. And so when, you, when you're looking across that type of data and you're sort of doing that co comparison, you know, someone asks, are we impacting equity? And what are our performance indicators? Um, the indicators are that, you know, the time is up, We've had to form, you know, private, you know, uh, public relationship partnerships, you know, people like we are here today, um, you know, getting together and, you know, not just sort of eyeing the problems, but coming together and finding the solutions that we actually already know. And so, um, you know, it's, it's about implementing what we are seeing and, and bringing that together. So educating, implementing, and you know, making things more seamless. Yeah, yeah, um, like, oh, please go ahead. So I think just from, uh, from the foundation perspective and given who our partners are, you know, there's in civil society, there's tremendous fragility right now of the nonprofit sector that, you know, addresses a lot of the uh, social determinants of health but also have the access, the trust with uh, communities and particularly those who are most heavily affected right now by COVID and other diseases. So as we're marching along with the government response, the, the health system response and everything, um, this sector, which has not been able to raise a dollar in the last year, because they can't even do a bake sale or a cookie walk or you know, and anything, um, is extremely fragile and really needs to be supported and brought into the resources that are being made available for community outreach and engagement, you know, as an example, and um, sort of formalize that, that process so that we don't lose them. And just from a democracy and, you know, the fabric of our society, that they are who really hold us together together right in our community so having you know vibrant and healthy communities really we can look to our nonprofits as being largely responsible uh, for that and that sector really does need 
um, very you know, explicit and intentional support in capacity building so they can line into where the resources are coming to address COVID, but also beyond in terms of recovery and, and going forward. So I know we have to uh, start to wrap up, but I wanted to, to um, just pose one last question as we end. So we have a new administration in place and uh, Dr. Theodore and myself and, and Carol Carter under the Global Minded uh, Health Equity Platform has said that we want to create a platform where there are national leaders and, and that we would be a sort of a resource for the, for the new administration on the top four to five things that we think uh, should be done in order to move the health equity uh, agenda. And I know that there are already individuals who are in place that are leading up a task force, but if there was a way for, uh, if you had the, the ear of the president of the current administration, what would be that one actionable item as we start to think about implementing that you would like to see happening as we end? How about we uh, start with uh, Dr. Lynn? Great, thank you, because I have a meeting with the university president that I'm a minute late for now. <laughs> I'm just going to say universal coverage that is comprehensive. That, that just has to happen. It's it's inexcusable and it's simple and uh, he's got a majority and he can get it done. So thank you. <laughs> well, Donna, I know you may have to leave, so thank you very much for joining us. Maybe I'll just jump in to say in terms of one response is I, as I think kind of a carrot and stick approach to our healthcare systems to address equity, whereby healthcare systems are either rewarded or they are in some way penalized if they don't actually acknowledge the population health issues that exist in the communities that they purport to serve, to serve as kind of a stimulus to address them. So I would say at the sort of at the systemic federal level, we can really create the incentives for medical systems to begin to systematically address these population health inequities. I love that. Well, and I, and I say, you know what, Crystal and Patty jump in there because I'm going to close with what I think the thing is too. So I want to hear from you. We want to hear from all you guys. So I would say just uh, set clear health equity national goals that go beyond what's in Healthy People 2020. And then, as I mentioned earlier, really um, encourage all agencies to have, you know, Office of Public Private Partnerships for health equity that can drive those, those goals. Sounds great. Thank you. And, you know, I would add again, you know, really racial bias training for our, our medical um, uh, you know, system um, so that we can see some real changes from you know, the likes of what happened to Dr. Susan Moore. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we saw broadcast and it was also shared uh, widely on, on social. Thank you. Pierre, anything else from your standpoint? You guys did an awesome job today. I just want to say that um, the five largest tech companies have made the most amount of money in the last year. And I want our organizations to knit together a strategy for a big lever solution that I know we're capable of. And then I want to go to Google and Facebook and some of these places, Amazon, and I want to get them to match funds that you guys can match out of your foundations. And we can move these things and start delivering major solutions at scale. And that has to happen, it has to happen. We've got to start moving the money in order for the on the ground issues to really shift and change. So that's, yeah. that's my closing two cents. And I just want to say every day this week, we have different equity. We've got STEM equity tomorrow. We've got foundations and funders on Wednesday. We've got K-12 on Thursday. And we'll be also at the uh, virtual Davos on Wednesday morning. If you guys want to join us for that, we'll have it in our newsletter. But I just want to Thank Pierre and Monique for hosting these sessions every single month. And then Patty and um, Crystal and Donna, I think, are just remarkable leaders. And um, it's just refreshing to have people really share a lot of the real scoop of what's happening so we can figure out how we can all be more effective. So 
Thank you all for everything. Everybody stay safe because I think we are going to be wearing masks and staying safe for many months as this continues to reveal itself. So thank you for everything.